Good morning, Hillcrest. Good morning. Good morning. Pretty good. Good job. Um, if you're new here, welcome. It's a great place to worship, and we're thankful you chose here uh, this morning. Um, for those regular attenders, thanks. Good to see you. Just love to see faces. Love to see faces. It's good to be back together. Um, I overheard a story about a woman who loves to read. And she goes to libraries and she goes to bookstores. And she checks out uh, the, the books. As she looks at them, she sees that they're intriguing. She pulls it off the shelf and she reads the last chapter. And that is the evaluation whether she wants to go back and read the whole rest of the book. And if she does, then she checks out the book or she buys it from Barnes & Noble. Otherwise, she puts it back on the shelf and picks something else. Odd, isn't it? Really odd. Well, I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, I've, I've struggled. I really have. I'm a social person. I love to see people. And being stuck in a bedroom look, looking at a little uh, computer with people about that big is not my idea of, you know, relationships. And so I've really struggled. And I'll tell you what, I had uh, kind of an epiphany a couple weeks ago. Uh, Revelation, chapter 17, verse 14. It says, they will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will be victorious because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That's the last book of the Bible. You know, when we realize He's victorious, the battle is His. There's no panic in heaven. He's got it under control. And I needed to hear that. And as this song came on my life about four weeks ago, it's become, it's been something that's really I've, I've stood upon, that the battle is the Lord's and we will see a victory. If we know him personally, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he wins and the battle is his. There's no panic in heaven. He's got it under control. And I need to know that. I need to hear that. So this morning as we sing the song, see a victory, the battle is the Lord's. We exalt the name of Christ. We will understand that he is our living hope and that we will praise his name forever. That's our song set this morning. We hope that you'll find joy and connection with God this morning as we sing these songs. Please stand with us.
the sea of victory, for the battle belongs to you, Good morning, Hillcrest. It is so good to see you all. And I know you're smiling behind those masks. I can tell. I can see it in the eyes. But it is so nice to be back here and to worship together with you. Thank you, worship team. My name is Nicole Stefile, and I'm going to share with you today a little bit about Family Connect. We have an event happening today, this afternoon, 1230. Um, and Family Connect, for those of you who don't know, is our ministry to the young families at Hillcrest and to the young families in our community. And it was started about three years ago when we kind of took a look at our community and realized like all these young families are moving into our area and we want to connect with them. We want to get to know them. We want to 
um, to introduce them to Jesus. And so we started Family Connect out of that desire, and it has, God has been faithful and continued to bless this ministry, and it's been so exciting to watch how God has worked. And one of the ways he's been super faithful to us is through our volunteers. It's been awesome to watch as people come in to serve and, and get blessed themselves. It's been fun to watch people who thought, like, I guess I could try that out, like, you know, and then find that they have kind of a new talent or a gift that they didn't even know they had. Um, one of my favorite things to watch with the volunteers is um, just the way they're able to connect with the families, especially the new families. Um, I think of the people who come in for the first time on a, maybe a, usually we're a Friday night, so when they come in for the first time on a Friday night, maybe they're new, checking it out, and a volunteer comes up to them and just says, yes, go ahead and have a seat. Just sit with your family and we're going to bring you dinner. Like that, as a mom, like touches my heart. <laughs> That's amazing. And so to see volunteers interacting then as they're eating, as they're sharing a meal together and helping with their kids and, and different things like that, like that's, that's amazing for me and really fun to watch how God works that way. Um, another thing that's very cool is to see how God has brought new families to Hillcrest through Family Connect and how these young families start coming. They, maybe they've been introduced um, by a friend, and they start coming to these events or activities, um, and fun for the family, and then maybe after coming for a few times, and sometimes maybe even a year, they take the plunge and come on a Sunday morning. And to see them here and know that they're getting to hear the word of God, that their kids are in the gym getting to hear the word of God in a new and exciting and fresh way is so awesome. And to know that they've made connections in the past, so they come not as a stranger, but they already know some people, um, it's, it's really cool to see. Another way that God has just um, used Family Connect in my own family is with my kids. And as a mom, it's, you know, one of our goals, right, as parents, to watch our kids grow in their faith. And to be able to see my kids grow in their faith through Family Connect has been amazing. My oldest has been known to just ask or just tell a, tell a classmate, um, hey, I'm going to Family Connect tonight. You should come. It's really fun. And then this family who I didn't know at all now becomes part of our family and, and, and is coming. And that's really fun um, to know that she and, and other kids have a platform that they can feel comfortable and excited to bring their friends to. And then that they have, a heart of, they have a heart of service, that my kids have, you know, maybe they're a little biased, but they love to help serve and family connect. And um, my youngest, just this past week, said, when am I old enough to help in family connect? You know, I think she might have been thinking, you know, singing up on stage, but I said, Gabrielle, you are helping. You are helping in family connect. Remember when you set the table for everyone, when you helped put out the napkins with your sisters? That was serving. So for me to see my kids get excited about living for God, about serving God, about loving God, that is super cool. So this afternoon, we are going to have our first event that in a long time, so we're super excited. 1230, we're going to have subs catered in, so we'll have lunch for everyone, kind of a little picnic lunch. Uh, we'll try to keep some social distance. We were hoping the lawn, but we may be in the gym. And then after a little lunch, we're going to do a large group bingo with prizes. So something fun for the family. So if you're a young family, we would love to see you today at 1230. Um, if you know a young family, please invite them. Be looking for these opportunities to invite them in. And if you're not, we would just love to have you as a volunteer. So be, be able to connect with those young families in a fun and exciting way. So we hope to see you at 1230 today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your faithfulness, for how you've shown us time and time again that you come through, that you deliver. Lord God, we thank you for the families that have been connected through Family Connect. We thank you for the volunteers. We thank you for how you have been faithful in each and every one of the families here. 
I thank you for this ministry. And Lord God, I just ask that today as we plan for this next event, that you would be bringing new families, that you would help us to connect with them and show what it looks like to live life with Jesus. Lord God, I ask as Eric comes up to preach that you would open our hearts, that you would give us new and encouraging inspiration and in how to live for you. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Good morning, Hillcrest family. Come on, now we're back together in person. You got to give me a little more love than that, people. Good morning, Hillcrest family. Good morning. Okay. Didn't need to go quite that hardcore. All right. Um, no, that was great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so if I haven't had the chance to meet you before, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here, and I know that whenever a person gets up in front and speaks to a group of people, it's, you know, sort of a throwaway line to say, like, oh, like, I'm so glad to be here, you know, that kind of thing. No, but, like, really, this morning, like, I'm really glad to be here, right? Uh, I know it's sort of like the theme of everyone up front who has said that. It's just so good to be back together, and it, it truly is. Um, I want to give a little shout-out just to, like, any parents or educators out there. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've started to develop a little bit of a twitch associated with virtual schooling. You know, like whenever somebody talks about virtual school, it's like the heart rate increases. I start perspiring, like start having uh, nightmares about missing a deadline and your kid was marked absent and they have an F and they're not going to get into Harvard on schedule and, you know, with all that kind of thing. So you can like, you can like laugh at my bad jokes too. Like give me that, you know, we've been preaching to the screen for a long time and so to have your real laughter to my bad jokes, it's like, good. thank you. Yes. I'm talking about Gabe. Got my back. So yeah, it is really good uh, to be in the same space. Um, and then those uh, worshiping with us online, uh, grateful that you can, that we have this technology, right? That even uh, for those who are not comfortable um, being with us or who have uh, just health concerns, uh, that we have this technology so we can, at least in some way, be together and worship together, even if not physically in the same space. So uh, there you go. Uh, we are in the second week of a new teaching series in the book of First Peter called Live a New Identity. Um, so if you uh, have like a Bible or want to grab one in back, I'll have it up on the screen to follow along too. Or if you're a smartphone Bible person, uh, feel free to go ahead and grab that. First Peter um, will be in chapter 1. So last week, David started us off in the first couple of verses, and we looked at this idea as how Peter is writing to elect exiles. And then we as the church today, we are elect exiles. So as exiles, we are people who our day-to-day -day experience is not all that we wish and hope it would be because we live in a, in a fallen uh, world tainted by sin. Um, and yet we are elect. We are chosen of God, beloved uh, of God. And there are holy moments all around us if we just have eyes to see it. Uh, so that was last week. And then this week uh, in verses 3 through 5 uh, in chapter 1, and uh, the title for today is The Source of Ultimate Joy. Source of Ultimate Joy. So that's what we're looking at um, today. So let me uh, read our passage for us. Look at our big idea and we'll jump in. All right. So 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So that's our passage. Uh, here's our big idea, just kind of where we're heading. Through a spontaneous outburst of praise, Peter shows that joy is available to exiles. The source of this joy is new birth, which is secured through the resurrection of Jesus and allows exiles to live with hope. All right, so that's uh, where we are headed. So let me pray for us, and then we will jump in. Father, you are uh, generous to us to allow us to gather uh, like this, to allow us to hold your scriptures uh, in our hands and have technology so that we can access it and study it closely in so many different ways. Uh, we pray that our hearts would be sensitive to what you would have to say to us through your word. Um, 
And God, as, as I speak, I ask that uh, what I say would align with your word and that when your word is spoken, it would impress itself on, upon the hearts of these listeners, that it would even become a part of their lives as they go out from here and follow you Monday to Saturday and in all places and all areas. So we uh, commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, this passage begins with these words, uh, blessed be. So we're going to see that Peter begins by expressing ultimate joy anchored in God the Father. This is expression, blessed be. And really this whole passage is sort of couched under this heading, these opening words of blessed be. So I'm going to show you just kind of a little Bible study trick that I like to use. Um, this, so what's, what works great is you can just like open up a Word doc and copy and paste the text in, or even better yet, like type it in so you're forced to like think about the words while you type it. And then once you're in that doc, you kind of uh, start hitting uh, enter and start new lines every time you come to a new verb or a new prepositional phrase. Okay, I'm talking about grammar. I'm putting some of you to sleep. It's okay, guys. It's cool. It's Bible nerd stuff, all right? Um, but you kind of, and it, what it does is it, you end up with something that looks like this. And it gives you sort of a visual of like what in the passage is most key or most important. And those things which are farthest to the left are sort of like the main ideas, and those things which are to the right are like subordinate to the ideas above them and to the left of them. And so in this passage, you can see blessed be is the main idea. The whole passage is simply an explanation or a riff on this idea of blessed be the God and Father. We know this because the next line is according to his great mercy. According to whose great mercy? Well, God the Father. And so the whole, ex the whole passage is just an explanation of why God is blessed. Why, why, why would that uh, be, why would he be blessed? Um, so that's uh, just a helpful way of seeing that this whole passage is kind of couched under that idea. Um, now, uh, as far as, um, whoop, whoop, you, don't want to give you away? Okay, all right. Uh, as far as um, the meaning of the word blessed, I think it's important that we pause on that for a minute, uh, because unless you spend a lot of time uh, watching the British Bake Off, then I'm going to guess blessed be is probably an uncommon phrase uh, in your life. Um, by the way, we do spend a lot of time watching British Bake Off in the Duncan household, um, which is a little ironic, because we are gluten-free, dairy-free as a family. Self-inflicted torture, I guess. Um, but we, we love that show. And so, blessed be, uh, what does that mean? Um, this is, uh, so we get, we're going to get to look at some Greek today, guys. All right, we got grammar, we got Greek. Yes, right? This is great. Uh, so, blessed, it's uh, the verb form of this would be eulageo. Um, so it's really two Greek words smashed together. Uh, so you and logo or logos or logos, if you've ever heard like that word before, um, big word in the book of John. Um, and so uh, good word, good word smashed together. That's like what, what it means, good word. And so the passage is saying uh, good words are God. Okay, it's like a little awkward, right? Um, you could say like God is the recipient of God good words, blessed, or the, the NIV says praised. What does it mean to be blessed, to be one who receives good words? So, um, oh, and then just a little tip too. I'm just giving you guys all like the study hacks today, all right? Uh, so, great website, studylight.org. If you ever want to dig into the meaning of a word and you're like not sure, or different translations have different versions of the word, you're like, how do I find out? Love studylight.org. It's just a screenshot of where I grabbed some of this information from. It's totally free, available to anybody. Um, so there you go. Uh, just a cool tip there. So one who receives good words. It's this expression uh, of praise. And um, is it going to stay there? So in other words, Peter begins his letter by offering good words to exiles. Guys, Peter, Peter's starting off, he's excited. He's elated. This whole passage is a, an expression of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a spontaneous outburst of doxology, of simply expressing good words toward God for no other reason than that when God is thought of, good words spontaneously burst forth. And it's worth noting that that wording, blessed be, it's not a command. 
right? It's, it's simply a statement of faith. It's not a command. It's not, it's not exhorting. It's not saying, you guys, y'all need to bless God more. You know, God, he's just, his ego's kind of struggling. He's just not receiving enough praise lately. Like, you need to help him out, right? Turn up the volume. Or no, it's not saying that. No, it's a fact. God is praised. Uh, th- think about it this way. Um, let's imagine that there was a Broadway musical, and this musical won all kinds of awards. And its soundtrack went viral, its ticket sales set records, its lead performer and writer started getting asked to write songs for other movies, and even a star in a film alongside of Emily Blunt. And best of all, the musical was so good that it landed a multi-million dollar deal with Disney to become available on Disney+. Plus. Okay, we don't have to imagine this. What am I talking about? Thank you, Hamilton. You guys did way better than first service on that. Yeah, totally. Absolutely, Hamilton, for sure. Um, we don't have to imagine. It's the real thing. By the way, my family, we, we kind of love Hamilton. My wife got me into it first. It is not unusual to hear our four-year-old running around the house yelling, you know, I'm not throwing away my shot. Right? He's always singing the Hamilton soundtrack. So, uh, but, um, but imagine, right? Imagine that there was somebody who went and saw Hamilton. And they were just sort of like, meh. You yeah, know, whatever. I didn't think it was that great. I'm just really not into hip hop, or I just think that asynchronous dancing is like so lame, you know. Just, you know, right? They could say that, but, but it doesn't matter, right? You could say it's bad, but the objective fact is Hamilton's awesome, right? You could rightly say, blessed be Hamilton. Praise be Hamilton. Hamilton is the recipient of good words. If you don't like it, well, like, sorry, but the problem isn't with Hamilton, the problem is with you. Because whether you like it or not, Hamilton is praised. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here about God. It's not a command, it's a fact. Blessed be God. God is praised. It doesn't matter whether you praise him or not, he is praised. It's intrinsic to who he is. And as we consider this posture of praise, let's not forget who Peter is writing to and the circumstances in which Peter lives. Peter is a persecuted apostle writing to a community of exiles. So what Peter's saying to us is this, even in exile, it is possible to have good words on your lips. Even in suffering, even in a global pandemic, even amid racial tensions and political divisiveness, it is possible for your heart and your mind to spontaneously burst forth with joy. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Joy is possible. Ultimate joy, deep satisfaction. It's just a question of what that blessedness is rooted in. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing that you do is reach for your smartphone and start scrolling through headlines or checking emails, then we should not be surprised if there isn't very much praise on your lips when we first get up in the morning because our emotions are not being anchored in the character of God the Father, but instead in the chaos of a frightened world. But Peter says, no, joy is available to exiles. And that joy is anchored in the blessedness of God the Father. So what is it about God the Father that brings such joy? Why is it that when a follower of Jesus thinks about God, joy spontaneously bursts forth? Well, it takes us uh, to the next idea in the passage, which is new birth. The source of ultimate joy is new birth. And um, let's look at that in the passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, or to have new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, in the flow of the passage, you might just kind of read over that and be like, oh, I'm just going to keep moving. But once again, this is where it's helpful to use sort of that outline uh, approach. Oh, I think I might have already, did I go past it? Here we go. Um, Because we can see here, he's caused us to be born again. And once again, you see the rest of the passage then is an explanation of the content or of what it means to be born again. I'm born again to a living hope, to an inheritance. We're going to get to those here in a minute. Um, But for now, we'll see that it's, it's key that this joy, this blessed be of God is because of this new birth that we have. 
So the reason that God is blessed is because he's caused us to be born again. Now, uh, born again can be a loaded term. It can be a term sort similar to evangelical. It just kind of gets used and abused in headlines. It becomes more of a, a political or a partisan term than a term that has anything to do with actually following Jesus. But if we can set aside and move beyond those shallow and politicized uses of the term and dig into the idea itself in Scripture, it's actually an incredibly powerful and profound idea. It's an idea that begins in the Old Testament and then comes to full fruition in the New let me give you an example of this from Old Testament. So Ezekiel 36, God speaking, he says, I will give you a new heart and will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This sounds like rebirth type language, right? And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So at God's initiative, a new spirit will be placed in God's people, and as a result, they will become obedient. Now in the New Testament, there's actually only a couple passages where the idea of new birth is expounded on. Um, and that's interesting because it's born again. Sometimes we talk about being born again Christians. Oftentimes that's like a banner or a label for certain sects of Christianity. Um, and yet, it's only mentioned a couple times in the New Testament. Uh, one spot is here in first peter where we're at and then another spot is john chapter 3 where jesus is conversing with nicodemus let's look at that just real quick um john 3 jesus answers very truly i tell you no one can enter the kingdom of god unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again and then our passage According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again, or to have new birth. So, in all of these, like, what's, what's happening? What, what is this idea of new birth? New birth is a reconstitution of our inner being. It is a fundamental transformation of the self. It is expressing the idea, I have changed. And my own personal story, I feel like I just, just really resonate with this idea of new birth. Uh, I came to UW-Madison UW uh, for school as a freshman in college uh, years ago now um, because I wanted to party and get good grades. It's pretty much the deal. It's what I was after. Uh, but then while I was there, I started reading the Bible with a group of guys in my dorm, the old, the old Og Hall. You guys know the old one, right? previous alcohol, not the new one. It's like the Hilton over there these days, right? We, we really knew how to live in the old alcohol, all right? Um, but uh, as I was in this Bible study, my whole perspective on life began to change. I mean, how do you explain the fact that over the course of a few weeks, I went from thinking that binge drinking was pretty much like the best thing on the planet, to being a 19-year-old in the party scene and while I'm there, I remember being at a party and thinking to myself, I feel so empty. Or how do you explain that as a, you know, person heading to college, if you talked to me about Jesus or handed me a Bible, I would have had no emotional response to that. Jesus to me was just totally not different at all than any other historical figure. And yet then, I had a relative who was praying for me, and that relative, they mailed me a keychain with a Bible verse, and I remember looking up that Bible verse in Scripture, and I remember the words of that passage were like life to me. And then I, who was like a total pagan at the time, put a Bible verse on my keychain. It's like, what was happening? New birth, right? New birth at God's initiative. I was being reconstituted from the inside out. I was being remade. And God's people throughout history have wrestled with how to best articulate or express this idea that is really totally mystical. One piece of language used is, I saw the light. Or another one is, I was blind, but now I see. Or another one that the Puritans like to use a lot is, I was seized by the power of a great affection. I think we should bring that one back. What you guys think? I was seized by the power of a great affection. Or another one referencing the uh, Apostle Paul's experience. 
scales fell off my eyes. Just like we're, we're grasping, right? We're looking for language for words to try to express this experience that is so just difficult to put words to. So why is God blessed? What causes us to, to burst forth with ultimate joy toward God? The answer is new birth. It's a change that happens in our hearts that allows us to see with great clarity that which was already and has always been true, but we just couldn't see it before. But now, with the Spirit's help, we can. And this truth, this truth I think it helps to, to make sense of some of our experiences. I mean, it's strange, isn't it, that you can be like chit-chatting with a neighbor, you know, outside in, in your neighborhood, and maybe a topic of Jesus or the Bible or Christianity comes up, and, you know, as, as it does and as they talk about it, just this, like, malaise sets in. You can see there's just an indifference, you know, the Bible, meh, Jesus, meh, whatever, no big deal. And so, at the same time, there can be these two people talking, and, and one of them just has indifference toward Jesus, and then the other one is just like, Jesus is amazing! Like, he's so awesome! He's just like gushing, he's just oozing, there's this emotional response to who he is. How do you explain that? Just, it's new birth. It's new birth. We've been made new. If you have this new birth, then you will just praise God spontaneously, passionately, emotionally. If you don't have new birth, then you'll just pass Jesus by. And he'll look the same as anybody else. It's this new birth that creates in us an alertness to the majesty of Jesus. So the new birth is the source of ultimate joy. If that's the source of ultimate joy, then what is the experience of ultimate joy? What does this new birth actually bring about in our lives? And that is where uh, Peter goes next as he expands on ultimate, this joy, this blessedness, the experience of ultimate joy is living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again. To what? For, for what end? What, what does that mean? What, what's it like to be a person who's been born again? To have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what does it mean to have a living hope? What does that look like? As I wrestle with ideas in Scripture and what they mean and what they could look like in our lives, I often try to think about the opposite, right? Okay, well, what does it look like to live without hope then? What does hopelessness or not having a living hope look like? And in our context, um, I think of a couple things. I think it can look like religious dread or secular disillusionment. Religious dread or secular disillusionment. So, on the one hand, religious dread says, I sure, I sure hope I've done enough to escape God's wrath. Right? Like, I hope I'm good enough. I'm not sure, but I'm trying. And as soon as I slip a little, though, I'm, I'm scared. I've got some fear now. God might wipe me out and condemn me forever. I don't know. Right? There's an uncertainty before God. Religious dread pays no attention to the beautiful words of verse 5 in our passage, which said that you have a faith that is being guarded by God's power. Now note in that passage, it's, it's not works that are being guarded by God's power. It's not God has caused you to be perfectly obedient by his power. No, as Christians, we proclaim that Jesus is perfectly obedient and that we are flawed. He is righteous. We are sinful. We aren't good enough. It is only through faith in him that we become righteous in God's sight. And then slowly, imperfectly, in fits and in starts, because of our rebirth, we begin to be able to obey in increasingly mean meaningful in significant ways, but we aren't perfected. It is Jesus who is good. And then you say, okay, well, Eric, that's fine. The, the, eth, the essence of our salvation isn't uh, works, but, but, then it's, but then it's faith. So you just moved the problem over. And so now it's like, well, but, but what if I doubt? Or what if I'm like struggling to be as loyal to God as I should? Like, I'm just not really sure. It's like, well, wait, 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 wait. Is it up to you to guard your faith? Who's guarding your faith? According to verse 5, God's power. His power is 
guarding your faith. God has put a fence around your faith so that you can have assurance and not have to live with religious dread, but instead live with hope that you have right standing before God because and in Jesus. So that's one way that that hopelessness can look. How about on the other side? There's also secular disillusionment. There's, there we go. There's secular disillusionment. Um, It is amazing to me that among a people and a culture who claim that there is no God and that there is no objective moral framework, there is nonetheless such a hunger for purity, such a hunger for an abstract and inescapably moral idea like justice. There is a yearning for a world free from corruption, free from greed, free from racism, But what means of healing is offered to counter these dark forces that seem so intent on working through all of humanity? The problem is, there is none. Uh, Mark Sayers is a pastor in Australia and a cultural commentator that I listen to a lot. I love his thinking. Um, And he says this from a podcast, uh, The secular view affirms the theology of the fall, but denies the theology of redemption. In this way, the secular story is a partial version of the Christian story. The fall is real, but redemption is not. The secular world has inherited Christianity's prophetic tradition of self-critique, but in rejecting Jesus has forfeited any means of forgiveness or restoration. In other words, the secular view is all fall and no redemption. I mean, guys, it's the year 2020. Humans have been trying to fix the world's problems for millennia, trying to DIY our own redemption. And yet, here we are amid a global pandemic. We've got wildfires blazing on the West Coast. We've got politicians threatening the very fabric of our democracy. We've got deplorable levels of racial injustice in one of the supposedly richest and freest countries in the world. And yet, you think that if we could just tweak a couple policies or replace a few individuals in Washington, D.C., then somehow everything will be okay? Oh, No wonder people are so disillusioned. No, but as God's people, we have been reborn. We have a living hope. We don't look to the events of this world to calm our anxieties. We don't expect any politician to bring about ultimate healing. No, there's only one person who can bring about ultimate healing, and that person is Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can live with hope. And Peter goes on to tell us the content of that hope. What is it that we have hope in? What is it that we are looking forward to? And that's his last idea in this passage, which is our inheritance. The future of ultimate joy is an eternal inheritance. It's an eternal inheritance. Now, is when we hear that idea of eternal inheritance, we might initially think, like, that's, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I don't know, inheritance. How do, how do we think about that? Um, and there it is in the passage there, right? From the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So what is an inheritance? Well, something that is uh, valuable. In the future, okay, let me pause on the valuable. Some of you guys are like, oh man, the inheritance I'm passing to my kids is not going to be very valuable, okay, right? Um, but, you know, hopefully, right, theoretically, it's an ideal there, something to chase after. And in general, when you do talk about inheritances, inheritances ugh, it's hard to say the plural of that, inheritances, um, you, uh, you're talking about something valuable. Um, it's something that's in the future, and we're not exactly sure when we'll get it, And it's intended for particular people. 
Uh, so, so for me, um, I work uh, also for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, uh, our national office. It's on the uh, west side of Madison, and kind of the department I'm in, broadly speaking, is under advancement, which is sort of like fundraising, right? Trying to raise more dollars to help fund the mission for more college students all over the country to know Jesus and to follow him. And so within advancement, then, we have another little sub-department called planned giving. And in planned giving, we help people to write InterVarsity into their wills and into their inheritance in order that the, we can fund the mission to have God's work go forward. And uh, as, as we think about, like, that department, you know, it's people's inheritance, people's wills. It's, it's valuable. There's real money there. Um, it's, it's in the future. It's not now. And we're not exactly sure when we're going to get that money. Uh, and it's intended for particular people, right? So we can see how with the idea of heaven or the idea of our future hope, of what God has in store for us in the future, and here's this helpful idea, right? Because it's going to be amazing. It's valuable. It's worth pondering. It's worth thinking about. It's worth looking forward to. It's in the future. It's not now. We're not exactly sure when we're going to go and be with the Lord or when Jesus will return. Just some uncertainty about the timing. And it's intended for a particular people, as David talked about last week, we are elect exiles, the chosen of God. And so, inheritance is this fitting idea for what awaits us as followers of Jesus. And note also the words that Peter uses to describe that inheritance. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. <laughs> it's like, does Peter know his audience? Does he know he's writing to skeptics? <laughs> does he know he's writing to people who are suffering, right? They're skeptical. They're like, oh, is the inheritance really still going to be there? It's, it's probably being diminished by all this evil, isn't it? It's probably wasting away. Probably like some level of like taintedness is sneaking its way into God's space. No, no, it's imperishable. It's undefiled. It is unfading. It doesn't waste away day by day, little by little, like all of our earthly uh, possessions do. No, it is undefiled. It is unfading. And so there's hope there waiting for you. Even now, this inheritance is awaiting us. So Hillcrest family, there is joy available to exiles our experience in this world is challenging. We don't want to minimize our struggles, but God is blessed. There can be good words on your lips and at the front of your mind every moment of every day if you remember your new birth. You can experience ultimate joy, not from the turbulence of the world around you, but from the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and from clinging to the living hope that that resurrection brings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that never spoils or fades. Amen? Amen. Let's uh, pray together as we continue to move into worship. Think about this idea more of living hope. God, you are so good. You're so awesome and kind uh, to us to give us this inheritance, to anticipate, to root our hope in. We thank you for it. We thank you for this new birth and how it remakes us and gives us new eyes to see things in a whole different way. God, amidst the, the various and, and very real challenges facing each one of us individually as well as us collectively as a church and collectively as, as a world right now, we pray that the blessedness of God would be on the forefront of our minds, at the tip of our tongues at all times, that we would have this ultimate joy anchored in you and not in the ever-changing circumstances of the world. We're so thankful, Lord, for the living hope that we have in you. It's in your precious name that we pray together. Amen. Please stand.
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the dark Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You could imagine so great a Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Okay. 
back together and every Sunday we want to do four things we want to preach a sermon rooted in the text pointing us to experience God through his word we want to tell stories of his faithfulness and life in the body we want to sing song to his glory and every week we want to send you back out to continue to be Jesus everywhere you go and so here's my two encouragements this week if you haven't picked one of these up grab one of these this week I'm going to challenge you, write down praises to his name, just like Peter starts. Blessed be our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Write down those praises. Write down those moments of worship in this booklet. And then second, we have an event coming up. You guys heard of this triple treat? We try and be Jesus to our community around this time in Halloween. And so if God might place it on your heart that you would want to be invested as a people helping people find life with Jesus, my encouragement, email the office this week. We would love your help as we anticipate triple treat and continuing to be Jesus to our community. So as we conclude, may we sing as Peter did, oh praise the name of our God. We love you. 
And we can't wait to see you next Sunday. Have a great week, Monday to Saturday. And as you leave, just give some space. <laughs> Have a great week.